Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Colin, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Samuel. Really appreciate it. Most certainly. Well, obviously, every entrepreneur has an interesting story of how they overcame obstacles to become an entrepreneur. So I'm sure you have something very similar to share with our audience. Yeah, I mean, I'll take you back. So my, my, I, I was raised by a single mom. Um, I grew up on government cheese and food stamps. Um, my dad spent most of his time in prison. Um, I experienced a lot of things as a kid that you know no kid should ever have to deal with. I seen my mom get shot. Um, I mean, lots and lots of things as a child that uh, were just not easy. Um, you know, being evicted from our you know ha- apartment and you know living out of motels, like not quite homeless, but close at times. Um, and you know, I wasn't a great student. I didn't, I wasn't great in school. Uh, and you know, I basically barely made it through high school by the skin of my teeth and didn't have a lot of positive role models in my life saying, Hey, you need to go to school or school is important. Or maybe you should think about college. Like nobody was telling me that. So I didn't go to college. Um, not a ton of opportunity, you know, for somebody who didn't go to school. Um, my first, you know, job, real job was like lugging around furniture. I mean, you're like 20 years old, you know, and you get to stay outside and stay in shape. It's not bad, but, you know, uh, I definitely knew that that was going to lead me down like a similar lifestyle that I dealt with as a, as a child. And I literally had to beg and plead for my first sales job, like literally, cause I was not the most responsible adult, young adult. Um, and so I had to really beg for that first opportunity. You know, typical sales story is like, Hey, I went to school for this. Didn't work out, got a sales job, <laughs> right? Or the economy was tanked, got a sales job, right? You can always get a sales job, right? Sales is typically everybody's fallback plan, right? For me, there was no fallback plan. There was no plan A, plan B. It was the only option for me. So when I got that first job in sales, you better believe I made the best of it. You know, I worked my mm. tail off. I was the first one in every day, first one out, first one to leave every day, came in on the weekends, get my list ready, send proposals, you know, do anything that I needed to do, prepare for Monday. Um, and I did that for a while, worked my way up to the top. From there, I was, you know, promised a leadership position and I didn't get it. Frankly, I probably wasn't ready for a leadership position. Um, but they didn't tell me that. They kept telling me, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to make you a manager. You're going to have a team. We support that. Um, and uh, so I left and took a VP of sales position somewhere else. Um, did that for a while and then started my first company with my wife in uh, 2010. And then we grew that from 5 million. Uh, we grew that from zero to 5 million in 26 months. Hmm. Man, I, what a turnaround story of, you know, of your life, essentially. So essentially you went in that career path, uh, became an entrepreneur, learning sales as your first, you know, first order of business. And then you took that company with, that was the, was that the, the, the uh, voice over IP company? Or, no, that was before which, that. So that was monster technology. I still have that company today um, mm-hmm. and have a great team. Um, my stepdad is actually a sales manager over there hired some, some great sales reps early on, uh, trained mm-hmm. tons of people. We spent zero dollars on marketing. It was all outbound sales. Um, we had a good you know process. We had a good business. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And then in that business, because we're all outbound sales, we relied heavily on our phones and uh, we had challenges with them all the time. Voice over IP technology wasn't new at the time, um, but there were still um, a lot of quality issues and support issues and outages and things like that were pretty common amongst all the different providers. And we had all these issues. And you know, when your sales team comes in at 5 a.m. to call clients on the East Coast. And, you know, the only way that they get paid is by using that phone. Uh, they're not too happy with you when it happens a lot. And it did. So um, there was a, a IT guy in our building. He was our neighbor next door. His name was Luis. And he's like, ah, I think I can put something together that will work better for you. Um, so he threw some software on a virtual server and connected it to these, you know, carriers. And it worked better than anything that we had had previously. Um, mm-hmm. No more, you know, angry salespeople. Um, and I said, I think some of our customers might have these same challenges, and they did. And so then eventually um, ended up starting Monster VoIP, uh, ran that business for a little over two years, grew it to, you know, 6,000 users on the platform, um, mm-hmm. and then recently exited that company. Nice. So you had so many entrepreneurial uh, um, startups that you've built, and now you have this uh, the sales, sales cast as a, a podcast consulting company, essentially, right? 
Mm, not so much consulting, more, you know, done for you podcasting, right? So mm -hmm. typically the people we work with are busy. Um, they don't have time to figure out and learn podcasting other than showing up and doing their interviews, right? And so we help them instill uh, strategies that can help them drive revenue for their business or aligning business objectives with the podcast. You know, we do everything for them so they don't have to. They can do the, you know, the part that they enjoy, which is having conversations with awesome people. Um, and then we do all the post production and strategy and repurposing of content. Um, they don't have to deal with all the really difficult, challenging, frustrating parts of having a podcast. Most certainly. And I certainly want to get into the how do you leverage content and podcasts as a, as a revenue driving strategy. But before we get there, I kind of want to know what are some lessons you learned as an entrepreneur from all these different uh, companies that you founded? Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest thing is entrepreneurship um, has more failures than successes, right? Like we're talking about some highlights of things through my journey, but the in between the lines there, there's lots of times of me falling on my face, making mistakes, um, racking up debt. Um, trying to manage cash flow when you have, you know, high performing sales reps that are producing large commission checks. Um, there's lots of challenge in between there. So no, you know, if you're thinking about entrepreneurship or if you maybe have a side hustle or maybe you're just getting started in entrepreneurship, like just know what you're signing up for, right? Don't mm -hmm. compare your journey to somebody's big flashy success that they're talking about on social media, right? Cause it's not all rainbows. Like it's hard. It's not easy. Um, but the people that last and do well with entrepreneurship are the people that, you know, have grit and resilience and, and, you know, don't give up, um, can and can push through difficulty. And I firmly believe like all of those experiences that I had as a kid, right. Which many were horrible. I mean, I could go on and on. I have many stories, but I won't bore everybody here. Um, those built me for this, right? Like there's nothing in entrepreneurship that really scares me. Like it's just, you know, like I've, I've dealt with some horrible situations just in life in general. Um, and that's built me and molded me into the person that I'm today to be able to, you know, do some of these things and, you know, deal with them head on. What is your personal why? What, what keeps your drive going? Yeah. I mean, the simple answer is my family. I've got four kids, uh, beautiful wife. Uh, my wife and I started our first company together. She's now CEO of the household. Um, and you know, also my advisor, um, all of the time. Um, so yeah, my family, you know, like I said, I grew up with a single mom that worked a lot. We didn't have a lot of money. Life was tough. Look, there's people that have had it way worse than me. Right. Definitely. Um, but you know, giving my kids a, a better life than I had, uh, being the dad that, you know, I didn't have that. I wish I had that. I was, you know, envious of my friends that they had. Um, that's what drives me, uh, every single day. Um, and that's why I do what I do. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest lesson also for others who are listening in is no one has any excuse for why they can't change their circumstances around, right? You got to take ownership uh, like you did, right? You knock on doors and say, Hey, I need a job and I'm going to beg for it if I have to, and then I'm going to show up to work before everyone. And I'll leave after everyone left. And I'm going to come on Saturdays and prove that I can do the job, right? Even if I don't have whatever most other people claim that they have. That is the, the the biggest lesson. I think, you know, someone who's watching your story and hearing you to share that. Absolutely. I mean, that's such a solid point, Samuel, because I mean, everybody has a story, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you have a story. Whoever's listening, you have a story. Maybe your story is way worse than mine, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe it's similar. Um, we all have stories and you either let that hold you back or propel you forward. That's your choice. Nobody cares about your excuses, right? You, your situation is your situation and you can stay stuck, right? Or you can use that to push you forward. Talk to me a little bit about kind of the mindset you train yourself to have and also any sort of success habits that you have. Mindset is huge. And I, I didn't learn this early on, right? Like I just thought hard work will get me where I want to go, you know, and hard work is great. And especially like early, you're young, you have no family, 
you know, maybe you're single, you have low expenses, whatever, you can take a lot of risk, whatever the case is, whatever your situation, whatever your current circumstances are, you know, just working hard could be good enough to get you, you know, so far. Um, but the cha- problem there is that it would only take you so far, right? And then eventually you're trading time for money and, you know, maybe you're stressed out, maybe you're, um, you know, your health could not be good because if you're just, you know, overworking. The thing is, is if you actually take better care of yourself personally, you will perform better professionally, right? Athletes don't practice every day, all day, right? Like they have practice and they have time to rest and they eat healthy and they exercise and there's all these things that they do, right? So, um, you kind of got to look at it that way. Like, what am I doing to take care of myself personally? So that when I show up professionally, whether that's in a sales role, whether that's as an entrepreneur or a boss or a sales leader, whatever the case is, how do I show up as the best version of me mm-hmm. when, when I'm in that seat and how you do that is by investing in yourself personally, you know, getting good sleep, not overworking, taking breaks, eating healthy, exercising, maybe having a meditation practice or gratitude practice, a journal. Like these are all things that I'm just throwing out there because you got to find what works for you. Like my morning routine may not be a good fit for you, Samuel, right? You probably have your own routine that, that works for you. Like what is your, what does your morning routine look like? For me? Yeah, I have to wake up at 5 a.m. and I'm already working out on my tunnel by 5.30 because if I don't get that out of my way, I can't get because some days my days are longer because I have a sales call with somebody out of West Coast. So then in that case that I can't make an excuse saying, oh, I'm so tired, I can't work out. So I got to get my workout in. I got to get my mind cleared up and I'm already fresh before anybody in our organization shows up. I'm already checked my email, cleared my inbox. So I have a fresh start to my day. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Yeah, for me, it's there's even like small things, right? So I'm a I'm a 4 a.m. riser. I got to get my workout in the morning. Um, you know, I try to journal. I'm not great at it. Um, it's one of those things that kind of comes and goes. Um, but there's even other little things like I got to stay hydrated throughout the day. I drink a gallon plus of water every single day. Um, I meditate regularly. Um, and I used to think like, oh, I'm going to sit for like 30 minutes in the morning and that's going to be sustainable. And I'm going to be, you know, super mindful throughout everything that I do all day. And that's wrong. Um, so I had to adapt and change and find what works better for me. And what I found is shorter meditations throughout the day. That might mean a five or 10 minute meditation in the morning. That might mean a two or three minute meditation in the day when I'm preparing for something, or I'm feeling a little bit anxious about something, or maybe a little bit stressed out from something. Um, so like doing that throughout the day, um, And then, um, you know, all of these little things. So find something that works for you so that you're constantly investing in yourself personally so that uh, you're the best version of yourself in your professional role. Yeah, I think that it's a good point that you mentioned that bring your best self to work, right? Because that uh, eliminates the opportunity for you to make excuse for why you can't perform at your best professionally. Because if you don't have a really good personal disciplined life with good habits that gives you energy and enthusiasm and gets you fired up, then you're going to show up to work, not at your best self. And then you're going to perform it, you know, in such a way, especially if you're in sales function, right? You make excuses when you can't hit your quota, you can't get, you know, whatever output that you were expecting to get done at at work. And your excuses are, Oh, I have this problem. I have that problem. Um, But I think it is definitely personal responsibility is also a part of how well you perform in the professional world. So obviously, you know, with you building a lot of companies and having sales organizations built and advising other organizations on sales and things of that nature. So you probably learned a lot about how to make a high performance sales team to come together. What are some characteristics you look for in a professional who's either aspiring to be a sales leader uh, or are already in a sales role, but they can, if they invest into those areas, they can actually improve themselves. Yeah. I like betting on underdogs, (laughs) you know, people that have overcome some sort of challenge in life. The best salespeople are people that are, you know, curious, right? So, um, we're in the process of hiring some folks right now and we've been interviewing people and I'll tell you, most people get eliminated in the first round of interviews. And I'll tell you why. Um, what we do is, is we ask a lot of questions, rapid fire questions, and we're just really looking to see if they answer the questions and get a sense if they answer them honestly. Right. And some things a little bit personal, maybe, um, and how they answer that matters. Um, but we're really just looking to think, you know, can they, can they handle a lot of questions 
and can they think on their feet quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see when somebody's answering honestly and authentically, or they're sort of searching for the answer as they respond, right? So that's one number one. But the second part is for them to ask questions. And mm -hmm. so number one, do they have any questions? I mean, if they don't have any questions, forget it. They're out. <laughs> okay. What types of questions do they ask, right? Are they asking questions around, are they asking straight to the money questions, right? Or are they asking good questions? Like what is the, the podcast industry like? Um, what is, what are the ICPs you're targeting? What's your sales process look like? Um, who else is on the team? What's their success been? You know, if they start asking some really good questions, mm -hmm. then that's a good indicator that they're going to get moved to the next round. Right. Um, and then, you know, from there, you're looking for some key characteristics and personality types. That first piece is extremely Curious. important mm -hmm. because Curious people make great salespeople. Even in an account manager function or any sort of customer success function too, really asking the questions about the customer, their use cases and how they're using, what are their challenges, they can then tailor their solution accordingly. Absolutely. Now, the difference between somebody who'd be more like a customer success is, you know, more of an operator type personality, right? But really high performing sales reps have more of like a maverick type personality. You don't have to teach them, you know, like the best, you know, open ended questions that you have to ask. If they're curious, they're all naturally going to be asking questions because they want to know, you know, yeah. what, what keeps them at, you know, up at night and what kind of challenges are they facing? What is their current system? You know, whatever technology they're using, how, why, why that's not solving their business problems, right? Asking all the right questions and then really tailoring the solution to meet that specific need that the, the customer has. Yeah. Um, and you want to know something interesting? Mm -hmm. Great podcasters make great salespeople. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if you're in sales and you want to become better in sales, start podcasting. It could even just be a hobby, something that you interview people, but learning how to be a good interviewer, learning how to intently listen, learning how to be constantly flexing your curiosity muscle, learning how to go a layer deeper um, in a interview slash conversation with a person, like the skills that you acquire as becoming a better podcaster are so transferable over to becoming a great seller. Mm -hmm. So obviously you mentioned that you didn't have prior formal training, but you had to learn at the job in terms of sales skills and things of that nature. What were some of the books or uh, or mentors that you actually went to to get some of the best practices on selling? Yeah. I mean, so I, you know, had to seek out a lot of people as far as like blogs and, you know, courses and following people on social and books. Um, you know, some of my favorites, I love everything that Josh Braun puts out. Um, I'm a big fan of Andy Paul. I've got his new book over here, Sell Without Selling Out. Um, I really like Jake Dunlap. He puts out a lot of great content. Selling from the Heart from Larry Levine. Highly, highly, highly recommend that book. Um, if you're a sales leader or aspiring sales leader, you're going to want to pick up Revenue Harvest from Nigel, Nigel Green. It is like if you need to get your sales leadership MBA, that's the book you need to read. Um, I mean, I can go on and on. I know there's some I'm forgetting, but uh, that's just a few. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, some of those books will give you some of the best practices that you can implement today instead of having to go through the life experience and failing and then trying to fix your mistakes. Um, so yeah, I've, but you know, books are great, but sometimes you got to learn firsthand through experience. Like, that's true. especially if you're a stubborn person like me, you know, sometimes, um, you could tell me something a hundred times, but I got to experience <laughs> it firsthand to really get it. <laughs> Most certainly. So how, how has your approach in sales and marketing evolved? Obviously, you know, I saw from your LinkedIn, you also started some sort of an agency, um, you know, serving marketing solutions and all, all sorts of different things you've done. So over the years, how has your approach on sales and marketing evolved? I dabbled in marketing a bit, um, realized that I just, I prefer to stay in my lane, which is sales. You know, even as a seller today, you've got to be a bit of a marketer. Like mm -hmm. if you're in B2B sales and you're not creating original content on LinkedIn, you better start, you know, if you're not being creative with creating content or creative with your messaging, or there's lots of opportunities to be creative as a seller, to stand out, to grab the attention of your prospects, to run different sequences, to test different messaging and cold cow scripts. 
Like sellers can learn from marketing how to be better sellers. And in the same vein, marketers can learn from sellers so that they can market better um, because sellers are the ones having the conversations with people and can share information with marketing. So really, you know, more alignment between sales and marketing is, is really where companies thrive in a big way. Um, but, um, you know, for me, I've really just stayed in my lane. I know enough about marketing to be dangerous, but not enough. And it's not work that I actually prefer doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the one thing I'll say in sales is it's getting harder to get people's attention. And a podcast is a great way to get people's attention. Um, it's a great way to create original content, which you need to be doing if you're in B2B sales. It's a great way to build an audience that you own the attention of. It's a great way to get access to people that might be a little bit harder otherwise. Like there's tons and tons of benefits. Now it doesn't have to be like the most highly produced best podcast on this planet. You know, um, just get started and you know, you can get started on a podcast for less than a hundred bucks a month you know, with the tools that you need and the things to get the job done just to build the relationships and, and, and improve the skill sets. You have a business that's built around uh, helping, you know, founders or even entrepreneurs, right, to, to build and run a podcast as part of their overall marketing or sales strategy. So how can an organization leverage podcasts as a revenue driving um, channel? Yeah. So there's um, a couple ways, right? So one is top of funnel. So you can use the podcast as a way to open doors and build relationships with people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a target account list and let's say Samuel, there's a hundred people on that list. These are accounts that I'm trying to break into. We have zero relationship. We've collected zero revenue from these people. If you reach out to them through LinkedIn, phone, email, or even more of a, you know, a, a blended approach across all channels, you know, let's say you're good at trying to get people's attention. Maybe 10, maybe 10 out of a hundred raise their hand and say, Samuel, let's have a conversation, mm -hmm. right? Well, if you reach out to those same hundred people and you say, Hey, we're interviewing thought leaders like you in this particular space about this particular topic. We think, you know, I've seen some of your content or seen some past podcasts you've been on, you know, make it meaningful, like have a reason of why, why, why you, why I'm reaching out to you. And you ask them to come on your show. Mm -hmm. It's the exact opposite. 80, to 90% of those people are going to say yes. Hmm. And so now you've got 80 to 90% of the people on your target account list that you have a relationship with. Now, I'm not saying every single one of them is going to do business with you, but there's a good percentage that will, and it's a lot better than trying to work with the 10 through other approaches. And, and so podcasting can't solve all your prospecting problems, right? but this is for like really high value targets. Okay. Um, so that's one way. Another way that folks are using um, podcasting is like more of an ABM approach, right? And, and, and even more like a, uh, a mid funnel, right? So people who have already engaged and it's a way for them to serve them content that can be consumed in a way where um, it's better than them reading a blog. People who listen to a podcast are four times more likely to take action or reach out um, than somebody who reads a blog or clicks on an ad. So if you can serve the right people, the right content on the right distribution channel, you can increase how many of those people move forward in your sales cycle, right? Um, I've also seen people have a lot of success with using it to drive the close. So maybe accounts that are, they're already engaged with, or they've already sold into to really strengthen that relationship and deepen it and take it to the next level to cross sell, upsell, or maybe a deal that's stalled to move it forward. Um, it's a great way to add value and strengthen and build really meaningful relationships. Mm -hmm. What practical ideas do you have for someone? Let's say you have those target accounts of 100, you got a good amount of people to respond and, and engaged in, in wanting to do that podcast interview with you. And some actually even do that podcast interview. How do you progress that conversation to a sales discussion uh, to move them to, to want to discuss your solution or whatnot? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of people wonder this and they're like, oh, it's, you know, I don't know if I want to take this approach of them thinking, well, I only asked them on the show because I want to sell to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've had this done to me like early on when we first started SalesCast, um, I was invited on a podcast and it was like a 10 minute rapid fire questions. And then immediately after he tried to sell me some high ticket consulting package on starting a podcast and already had a podcast, right? So it was like very evident that he did no research. He only asked me on because he wanted to sell me this thing, 
right? Mm -hmm. And so you don't want it to feel like that, right? Um, and so there's some things that you can do. And, and here's the reality, right? Is you can sell more without selling because just for example here, you and I have a great conversation. I go on your podcast. And then when we're done recording the episode, you've been asking me all these questions, right? I'm naturally curious. Well, Samuel, tell me a little more about you. What do you do? Right. And that happens very often. And so if you're targeting the right people, then those are naturally going to go into your pipeline. Um, and so that's one thing like organically is going to happen if your targeting is on point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, if they're having a good experience. So what your flow looks like for getting them on your show, how you conduct the interview, what you do after the show, right? So there's all these things that you can do to really nail the guest experience where you're making them feel good. And then you are somebody that they want to work with, right? Because in sales, a lot of times people forget what you say. They remember a little bit about what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. And if you invite them on your show, you lift them up, you have good conversation, you come prepared, you ask good questions, you're collaborating, creating content, you give them something to share that lifts them up. And then you have a process in place to stay top of mind. You better believe those people are going to end up in your sales funnel. Hmm. So from staying in, uh, staying top of mind, you probably have some sort of a nurture that you start with those prior guests to keep them informed on what you're doing more, maybe even sh yep. sending them some episode that they should be yep. listening to things of that nature. I mean, they're going to go on your email list. Mm -hmm. They're going to, maybe you have a community, uh, for current customers and maybe guests, maybe you have some sort of, you know, networking component, uh, tied to it. Just a simple, thing is like, send them a gift, send them a thank you card, send them a thank you video. Those are all things that you can do post interview, right? Um, maybe you have something of extreme value that you can offer them like, Hey Samuel, thanks so much for coming on my show as a way of saying, thank you. You know, if you're ever interested, like, you know, every guest from the show gets a, you know, extended free trial to our, you know, super awesome SaaS product that we have, like whatever, you know, you can be creative with getting them to be more exposed to what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. What practical recommendations do you have for someone to increase the reach that they have beyond maybe that target accounts that you're trying to get into? As far as for guests or like audience and listeners to, to build, yeah, build the audience and listeners. Yeah. So the number one way to grow your podcast, if you're trying to grow your listenership is to get exposure on other podcasts. Now that could be through guesting, right? That one time you go. And then at the very end when they're like, Samuel, thanks so much for coming on my show. How can people connect with you? You're not going to say, Hey, LinkedIn, my web, you know, company website. Here's my side hustle website. You know, I talk about cool things on Twitter and then, Oh yeah, I have a podcast, <laughs> right? Because it's overwhelming. They're going to do nothing. And that right example I just gave you, that's not that far fetched. That is mm -hmm. what people do Reality. most of the time. Mm -hmm. So the proper way to do this is when somebody asks you, Hey Samuel, thanks so much for coming on my show. You say the best way to get in my world is to check out my podcast, give them your podcast name and link or whatever the case is. Um, and so that's the best way to approach that. Um, you know, you just say coffee, coffee with closers on all the podcast platforms, whatever the case is. Um, the other thing that you can do that's just not that one time visit, right? That temporary is you can create collaboration partnerships with other podcasters. So you find shows that are similar size of you and maybe they promote your show for a month and you do the same, you know, and you do like a little promotion and say, Hey, if you're a podcast junkie like me and you're looking for another awesome sales podcast to add to your feed, go check out my man, Samuel over at coffee with closers on your favorite podcast platform. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great way to grow your show that doesn't cost any money. Mm. I have a couple other questions that I want to ask you as an entrepreneur, right? So as an, as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of cr critical decisions that you have to make. So you have to be always on, you know, sharp mind thinking about ways to solve business challenges. So what, are, are there any decision making framework that you follow uh, to, to take decisions and to move things forward? Uh, I'll be honest. I'm a bit of a risk taker. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So sometimes like I have to, uh, seek advice from my wife, right? Cause she's like a little bit more conservative. Um, we're like, I'm a little bit more risky. Um, and you know, cause I'm just like, Hey, what's worse that can happen. I'll be all right. I'll figure it out. Right. So I don't have some framework of like, here's how I 
logically look at, is this a good decision? You know, I pretty much follow my gut for the most part, as long as it's somewhat, there's some good reason behind it, or I have some good evidence to, you know, test something. Also just having, you know, good advice from other people around you. Like, is this a good idea? Or is this a little crazy? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's about as formal as my decision-making process is. Yeah, and the total opposite I've seen is entrepreneurs that just sit on their decision for months and they never take yeah. any decision, right? Yeah, and- no, I'm more just get into action, you know, because pretty much just get started and iterate. That's what I live by. So let's talk a little bit about productivity because obviously all of us don't have enough of his time, right? So we got to get things done a lot. Obviously, you're hosting a podcast, you're doing coaching, um, you know, you're obviously as a guest on other podcasts. There's a lot that you have to get done. So are there any productivity hacks that you follow to get what you need to get done? Yeah, specific, I mean, specifically for entrepreneurs, like build a team, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, build a team, um, find people that you can rely on, you know, outsource things that you don't enjoy doing, um, stay in your lane, you know, do what lights you up, you know, what you enjoy doing, whatever that part of your business is. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you gotta, you gotta live and die by your calendar as an entrepreneur. Cause there's just so many things to do. And a lot of times the thing that doesn't get done is the most important thing, like sales and building pipeline and, you know, doing these things that like really matter more than, you know, I don't know, getting the books done or, (laughs) you know, doing other things. Right. So, um, you know, managing your time and your calendar is definitely important. Um, also just not overworking. You know, I think a lot of people think like, Oh, entrepreneurship is this like 20 hour days or whatever. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, early on. Yes. You're going to have to put some work in for sure. So make sure your life circumstances are going to like permit that, you know, if you got like six kids and like, you're thinking doing entrepreneurship, like you might want to rethink that a little bit. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but you know, maybe you need to have a co-founder or maybe you need to, you know, I don't know, maybe you need to raise some money and hire some people. I'm not sure, but you know, you got to make sure that your personal lifestyle is going to support that. Right. Cause our entrepreneurship is tough, especially early on. Um, but you know, I do a lot, but I don't ever work more than eight hours and I never work on the weekends. Right. So I get started early. I'm done by four o'clock every day so I can eat dinner with my family, read books, do all the, you know, help out with the kids, do all that sort of stuff. Um, so there is a way to have, you know, a good balance. Mm-hmm. Which brings me to some systems and process. So do you have like, are there any systematizing things that you do to remove yourself from the business as much as possible? Yeah. I mean, leveraging technology as much as possible, right? There's a lot of things that you can automate. There's a lot of you know, ways to, you know, integrate things and get them functioning better and remove manual processes, like, you know, spend as much time as you can, like making things more efficient, uh, because ultimately it's going to save you time. And then, you know, as you're building these processes out, like document them, because as soon as you can afford it, or as soon as you find the right person, like you want to stop doing those things, you know, and focus on things that are maybe more high level or that you enjoy doing. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? I would say find something you're passionate about that you enjoy doing because I've sold a lot of things and I used to think like, oh, you didn't need to be passionate or it wasn't important. Um, but now I finally have something that like I'm really enjoy doing and I'm very passionate about like working in the podcast industry and working with awesome people and helping them grow their shows and monetize their shows or drive revenue for their business through their show. Um, I really deeply enjoy the work um, and I never had that before. And I didn't think that it used to matter or I didn't think that it was important until I obviously experienced it. And I was like, oh, people that were saying that before, like they were actually right. Mm. Well, Colin, I really enjoyed our conversation together. And thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom with our audience today. Awesome. Thank you. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.